May I ask uh, all our visitors in the public gallery to leave quietly, please? And the next item of business is members' business debate on motion 8218 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on incontinence in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. I call on Alex Cole Hamilton to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for remaining behind for this debate. Ask anyone in this chamber or beyond it what their top five fears of age or infirmity might be, and you can be sure that the subject of this debate will sit right up there. But I want to state from the outset that if we as legislators assume that incontinence is only a condition of the old or infirm, then we are mistaken and we are part of the problem. I called for this debate because women and men of all ages across Scotland suffer in silence and it is high time that they were made aware of and given treatment, support and most importantly hope. Incontinence is still taboo. Patients are shy and embarrassed to talk about it or seek medical help and many assume that nothing can be done for them. And I dare say this may be the first time that we have debated the problem with such a focus in this parliament. So I'm glad that there are members of all parties present today prepared to put aside our hang-ups on the issue and look towards collectively relatively straightforward solutions. So here are the facts. One in three women and one in nine men leak urine. For women who have given birth vaginally, a remarkable 30% of them will have damage to their pelvic floor, while those who sustain a third or fourth degree tear during childbirth are likely to have problems with faecal incontinence. Statistics show it has a bigger impact on a person's, person's quality of life than nearly any other condition. And a recent survey of those in hospital over the age of 60 characterised incontinence as a fate worse than death. We don't actually know the true cost of incontinence to Scotland in terms of financial associated products, the causal impact on physical and mental health. However, in 2010, Australia made a stab at researching the scale of the problem. A study there examined the cost not only of sanitary wear, medication and surgery, but also the cost of dealing with depression and anxiety that can arise from it. This amounted to an annual cost to Australia of $43 billion. That's astronomical. Now, our two countries have similar societies and health challenges, so we can extrapolate that to around £5,000 for every Scot with the condition each and every year. There are a range of additional health complications with much bigger associated costs which stem from incontinence. It's linked to falls. Many older people will fall and break their hip by slipping in the night after not making it to the loo in time. They may then go on to become part of the 25% of those over the age of 80 who will be dead within a year after such a fracture. And we are all still waiting for the National Falls Strategy to build on the 2014 Falls Framework that this Parliament voted for earlier this year. Only one, uh, one of the only surgical interventions available when sufferers are beyond the help of physio uh, is the transvaginal mesh implant. And I, along with colleagues from all parties, met with mesh survivors on a visit arranged by Neil Finlay last year. Thanks to their campaigning efforts, we have all heard of the very awful traumas that they have had to endure as a direct result of botched treatment for incontinence. And finally, there is a direct causal relationship between male incontinence, erectile dysfunction, and male mental health issues. And given that, such an in, that much of the increase in suicide rates last year are caused uh, were among young Scottish men, we cannot afford to ignore this link either. Deputy Presiding Officer, there are solutions to this terrible condition, and they're not rocket science. Going back to childbirth, those women who are left with rectus ab abdominis diastases or separated tummy muscles at birth are prone to develop back pain and vaginal prolapse. These, men, these women could be easily identified on the maternity ward and referred to a physiotherapist. We also have a six-week postnatal check in place, but there are currently no requirements to check how these muscles have healed, and not all GP practices routinely follow this up. We can prevent more women finding themselves with this debilitating condition if they are empowered with knowledge both before and after giving birth. It is astonishing that a country that can provide a box to new parents with a poem from the Macca does not yet routinely train midwives and health visitors in basic pelvic physiotherapy. 
We must do this as a matter of course so that we can inform mothers about postpartum exercises or what to look out for after tearing and when to seek treatment. Secondly, we need to include an understanding of pelvic floor exercises as part of the curriculum in either PSE or in PE so that young people are aware of their own pelvic health. There is evidence that physiotherapy works for all ages and also years after the onset of treatment. But many people who suffer from incontinence don't even realise that treatment can improve their symptoms. Finally, we need to normalise the discourse around this issue. With only 30% of sufferers coming forward for help, we need to build an awareness so that everyone affected knows how to get help and that they are not alone. None of this would cost very much money, but could significantly improve the quality of life for those who experience this con condition at any time of life. Deputy Presiding Officer, incontinence is a huge and underrecognized public health issue in this country. Evidence shows that we can prevent it and manage it with physiotherapy. We need to better support those many Scots, some of, us, some of whom are known to us personally, who will contend with this each and every day. I'd like to close by thanking my friend and constituent Elaine Miller, who is a pelvic physiotherapist and a comedian, and is leading a one-woman campaign to bring this issue out of the shadows and, into, and to an international audience. She's in the gallery today, and will be bringing her show to Parliament next Tuesday. I, I heartily recommend it to colleagues. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is one of those health conditions which is indiscriminate of class or lifestyle, and it ruins lives, but we seldom give it the attention that it deserves. As such, I move the motion in my name. May I ask those in the public gallery to refrain from showing appreciation or otherwise? <laughs> Thank you very much. And we now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of four minutes, please. Fulton McGregor, followed by Annie Wales. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Alex Cole Hamilton for bringing forward this very important debate. And I'll just take the opportunity to remind the Chamber that I'm the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Health Secretary. Um, for my input, I, I'm actually going to focus uh, specifically on care homes, and there is a reason for that that will become clear, although I completely accept what Alex Cole Hamilton has said there. This is not a, a condition that is, is, is just, just affects one group. Incontinence is common in care home residents, with prevalence ranging from 30 to 80 per cent. And research has ident identified incontinence as a risk factor that increases skin damage, infection and falls in older people. In care homes, incontinence is primarily managed with absorbency pads, easy for me to say, which contains rather than promote and improve continence. National continence guide guidance suggests interventions such as toilet assistance, optimal fluids, nutrition and medication and can promote continence rehabilitation and reduce the, the use of pads in older people by up to 50%. Taking on this guidance, the Care Home Continence Improvement Project was developed by teams in NHS Lanarkshire and NHS National Services Scotland, a project aimed to improve the continence of care of people living in care homes in Lanarkshire, and the primary outcome to, to reduce the use of high absorbency products. Secondary outcome to reduce the safety risks associated with incontinence. A pilot took place in David Walker Gardens in Rutherglen and at Summer Lee House, which is a Balmer care home in my constituency of Coatbridge. And I'd like to mention um, that the both uh, were put forward for awards uh, recently. And I'd like to mention the, um, the motions that were put forward in the Parliament by Elaine Smith um, and by Claire Hockey um, recognising this. The 25th of October 2017, they were successful in these uh, awards, and it was the UK Go Wide Awards, which celebrate excellence in public procurement. And on Monday, just by chance in relation to this debate, I had the pleasure to visit Summer League uh, House and personally congratulate those involved in the project. And I spoke to a number of individuals, uh, including Alice McLeod, the nurse advisor of national procurement, and Margaret MacDonald, the care home manager, who was the project lead as well as uh, the owners who, who have got a particular good reputation locally um, for providing good uh, care home services. And uh, there's far too many people to mention that were involved in this particular project, but they include Irene Bartbay, Jean Donaldson, uh, and many others, but a special uh, thanks to the carers, residents, and families who were involved. And when I was at the care home on Monday, they, they put on a video that some of the, um, the families and, uh, and residents were talking in it, and it was actually very, very emotional 
uh, to hear the, the families talking about how uh, the, their loved ones' lives had changed since this project had been put in place. What did the initiative actually involve? The intervention of frequent toilet assistance, medication reviews, regular fluids and reducing caffeine intake, and the results were better than anyone had expected. Reduction in episodes of incontinence, reduction in pad use, less distress. Improved record keeping. Staff had more quality of time for residents, something that they reflected in their videos. 65% reduction of falls, a 50% reduction in UTIs, skin damage reduced by one third, 40% reduction in unplanned hospital admission for falls relating to UTIs. And residents actually began asking to be taken to the toilet. Residents that I heard that day that hadn't asked uh, for that particular assistance sometimes for years. The initiative demonstrates how small changes can make a big difference to people's lives, a point that Alex uh, Cole-Hamilton had also made, and the wider impact there was less pressure for hospitals and a reduction in procurement. They had actually also done an economic analysis and a saving in nine months of £250,000. So there's, there's real potential in that aspect as well. The initiative has the potential to be transferable to other care homes across Lanarkshire and Scotland, and I am in the process of setting up a, a reception just now, which I'll be asking the uh, Cabinet Secretary or one of the Ministers to attend. And I can see the President Officer, you asked me to finish, so I would just like to take the opportunity again to thank the Member for bringing this forward and giving me the opportunity to speak about the good work that was going on in my constituency. Thanks. And I have Annie Wells to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I also start by thanking Alex Cole Hamilton for bringing this debate to the Chamber today as a very important subject that can affect a person's physical and mental health at any point in their life. According to SIGNS 2004 clinical guideline, urinary, urinary incontinence is not a condition in itself, but is a symptom resulting from one or more underlying conditions. Therefore, the effective treatment of urinary incontinence depends wholly on thorough assessment and diagnosis. Estimates of the prevalence of urinary incontinence vary widely due to differences in definition and the expectation that many of those affected will not admit to having, having continence difficulties. NHS research estimated that between three and six million people in the UK suffer from some degree of urinary incontinence. An estimated figure show that between 210,000 and 335,000 adults in Scotland endure significant problems with incontinence. Those figures that equate to between five to 9% of our adult population. Urinary incontinence affects both men and women, as um, we've heard already today, at varying points in their lives, with women being five times more likely to experience it than from a man. The broad forms of urinary incontinence can be brought on by factors including age, the menopause, pregnancy and childbirth, high BMI and a history of urinary incontinence problems in childhood. 50% of women will experience urinary incontinence at some point, but figures show that only one in five will embark on seeking clinical help. In 2004, an American survey by the National Association for Continence reported that women wait on average six and a half years, with men waiting around just over four years after experiencing uh, bladder control problems before they seek um, advice of any healthcare professional. Urinary incontinence is consistently associated with adverse effects on quality of life for those with the condition, the extent of which are extensive and subject, subjective to the individual. This, these include social isolation, loneliness and sadness, depression, severe embarrassment, sig stigmatisation, effects in sexual relationships and disturbed sleep. Quality of life is also adversely affected due to the practical inconveniences associated with the condition, with frequent changes of clothes, bed linen and having to bathe more often, greatly impacts on a person's day-to-day -day life. With only around half of those with moderate or severe urinary incontinence seeking clinical help, we desperately need to identify barriers and improve awareness so that those experiencing incontinence can live full lives. By tackling the lack of awareness of treatment options and the perception that incontinence is a normal part of getting older, we can start to change the fact that many adults with the condition attempt to manage the problem themselves, often resorting to inappropriate measures which may, which may worsen their condition. 
Signs suggest that adults with urinary incontinence can benefit from changes in lifestyle and attains to behavioural advice as, as much as if, if not more than through pharmaceutical or surgical interventions. <laughs> By simultaneously improving awareness, raising campaigns, reducing people's perception of the associated stigmatic barriers and by promoting the awareness of physiotherapy techniques to manage the urinary incontinence, this will undoubtedly encourage more people with urinary incontinence to seek life-changing help. Thank you. Can I have Monica Lennon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I also congratulate Alice Cole Hamilton for bringing forward this motion for debate this afternoon. As the motion rightly highlights, incontinence has the potential to affect everyone at some point in life and can arise from a variety of medical conditions. But the taboo around the subject often prevents the vital discussion which enables people to get help. Stigma and embarrassment around incontinence prevents many people experiencing the condition from seeking help. Research shows that more older women experience incontinence than breast cancer, heart disease or diabetes but the condition is rarely talked about, and less than one third of those affected seek out professional help. That's why I find it to be very welcome that we're here debating this in Parliament openly today, and why any actions we can take to implement policy to improve life for people with this condition should be explored. I noted in particular the calls from researcher Joe Booth from Glasgow Caledonian University, who has outlined the need for a national strategy on continents considering bladder and bowel health across the lifespan, as well as a public health campaign to challenge the normalisation of the issue of incontinence. We should be encouraging people to seek treatment and help from preventative services, because the bladder condition of almost three quarters of those experiencing incontinence can be significantly improved or even cured with lifestyle and behaviour techniques. There is clearly more work to be done in getting the message out there that incontinence is a medical issue for many people. And it's not something you just have to put up with or a natural part of ageing. There is some action that can be taken to help ease the condition. And I hope the Minister, or the Cabinet Secretary rather, can address some of these issues around the need to address stigma and raise public awareness of incontinence and its treatments in her closing remarks. One of the vital issues that was raised uh, during my preparation for today's debate is the obvious and necessary requirement for those who experience incontinence to have access to public toilets. Crohn's and Colitis UK in particular have raised the very important point that incontinence is a hidden disability. Being unable to access a toilet has a huge impact on the ability of people with bladder conditions to access public life and carry out their everyday lives, including activities we all take for granted, like travelling, shopping, socialising and working. The social model of disability points out that disability is caused by the way society is organised. And using this model of disability, those with bladder conditions causing incontinence can be disabled from full participation in daily activities because of the inaccessibility of public toilets. I fully agree with that view and ensuring access to toilets is a public health concern. There should be a duty, I believe, on authorities to ensure there is an adequate supply of local toilet facilities. When local council budgets are experiencing sustained year-on-year -year cuts, it's perhaps not surprising that there is a pressure to try and make savings by closing down facilities like local public toilets. However, we should recognise that access to such facilities are a right and a public good. Any savings made by closing public toilets is surely offset by the even greater social and economic costs which are caused due to social exclusion. I recently raised this issue about access to public toilets with Network Rail as part of my ongoing campaign to improve access to sanitary products and ensure there's legislation in place to make sure there's um, no one goes without uh, vital sanitary wear. But in many railways and, and bus stations, there's a charge in place to access toilets. And this acts as a, really, you know, a, a very real barrier for those who need to access a bathroom urgently. And it's an issue that I hope that all public bodies in Scotland will look at more closely. I um, realise that my time is up, so I'll finish by saying I would welcome any progress on the calls for a national strategy or action plan on continents, which I think would address some of the issues that have been raised across the Chamber today. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased we're having this debate today and thank Alex Cole Hamilton for making that possible. From the speeches we've heard, incontinence is a public health issue that is affecting millions, but it seems to be covered up and hidden from view for a whole variety of reasons, including the stigma Monica Lennon mentioned. But it's also a public health issue with some real win-win solutions. The advice for preventing urinary incontinence is in many ways the same as that for reducing a whole spectrum of medical problems and living a healthy life. NHS choices advice suggests working towards a healthy weight, cutting down on alcohol and keeping fit. And for incontinence in particular, keeping those pelvic floor muscles strong. Now, following all this advice won't mean you never experience incontinence, but it can help. For those living with incontinence, the access to the right medical help is vital and getting treatment early can help massively. Incontinence shouldn't be allowed to limit our life choices. And that phrase kind of brings to mind some of the adverts that you'll have seen on television. But I'm actually trying to make a broader point, which the brilliant physiotherapist comedian, there's a job title for you, Elaine Miller also makes. She says in an email to all MSPs that a significant and almost totally unrecognised factor is that incontinence is a barrier to exercise. Diseases of activity are now responsible for 1.6 million premature deaths, which is on a par with smoking. Um, in Parliament last week, I think Professor Nanette Moutry said inactivity has actually exceeded smoking as a global killer. But incontinence is largely missing from obesity management. Once your BMI is over 36, you'll probably wet yourself when you run, which may be significant when considering poor exercise compliance. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton spoke about how incontinence can affect both men and women and people of all ages, but I suppose, you know, in my own experience, it's something that I started discussing with, um, you know, with many other mums after my child was born some time ago now. And it is a fact that after having a child yourself, you're more likely to find yourself trampolining with toddlers, but you're also, you know, less likely to be able to do so without worrying about incontinence. So I, th I think this link with physical exercise is very well made and important. And I've not seen Elaine's award-winning show, but I'm really looking forward to a taste of it next week. Um, I think on the 21st, when the arts company Fair Play, the charted, Chartered Society of Physiotherapy and Elaine will be in Hollywood, so I hope we all see one another there again. Um, she may also be the only comedian to star on the NHS Choices website and to have her show accredited as continuing professional development for healthcare professionals. Um, but an important point here is that tackling incontinence in the most effective way will require more physiotherapists to guide people through exercises more people in health and out with who are comfortable and have the time to talk about this issue, less taboo as a whole about recognising, discussing this, especially in younger people. The main message from the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy is that physiotherapy, physiotherapy is highly clinically effective and cost effective too. They report 50% of women reporting incontinence, model, who said they were moderately or greatly bothered by it, 27% unwilling to go to places where they were unsure about the availability of a toilet. 31% dressing differently because of the problem. Monica Lennon has made the point that Crohn's and Colitis UK pick up on that very, very important point. Um, I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could address that in closing. I'd also be grateful if she could address the point of free access to incontinent pads for those who need them, and also about how we all might work together in Parliament to make sure that this issue is no longer taboo, that today is the, part of a, today's the start of a broader discussion, and that we really start to tackle this issue with the seriousness and the urgency it deserves. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Essentially, this debate is about uh, the competition, the tension that there is between social embarrassment in talking about the function of our bowels or our bladders and the underlying medical urgency that may be associated with such dysfunctions. Because if the social embarrassment wins, then that has the risk of delaying the opportunity to engage with medical assistance and advice that may well be necessary. Uh, to protect us from severe impacts from underlying conditions uh, that uh, need urgent attention. Now, 
I will say for my own part in this debate, and kind of when I look at members' debate, I often learn things that I simply hadn't been aware of. And it had never occurred to me that this particular issue had a gender aspect to it. Uh, at my age, perhaps, you might forgive me for, for being uh, perhaps a little fixated about the future prospects of the operation of the older gentleman's uh, prostate, neglecting to understand the issues associated with pregnancy and incontinence in females, and indeed hearing uh, that it's a bigger problem for the female uh, than it is for the male. So, for my part, I have learned something. But I hope, too, that this debate, which Alec Cole Hamilton ha has brought to us, and I'm very grateful for his doing so, uh, will more broadly enable people to feel a little bit more comfortable about talking uh, about issues that are rarely discussed at the dinner table. Uh, because it is an issue uh, that is important. Caledonian University in Glasgow reports that 30 to 40 percent of people under, uh, over 65 living in their own homes and 70 percent of frail older people living in care homes struggle with incontinence. So it's not a matter of any triviality and despite what Alison uh, Johnson said and I will look for some of the references she made um, I haven't previously thought it was a matter of humor but if humor is a vehicle for making it something that we can talk about and make sure we recognize uh, then that's uh, very much uh, to be welcome healthcare professionals uh, a lot is expected of them uh, but in this particular condition I hope that uh, practice nurses, who are often going to be the ones who may be consulted, perhaps rather than GPs, uh, have the appropriate training and the sensitivity uh, to raise uh, with patients uh, what may be uh, something of considerable embarrassment. Patients will often go uh, to their primary health provider for reason other than this, and it may emerge as a secondary thing. Uh, that comes out, or it may be something that simply questions about general health from the primary health uh, uh, provider. It will reveal that there is an incontinence uh, problem uh, that is part of the patient's uh, deterioration in general health. So I hope that midwives, health visitors, physiotherapists, practice nurses, and GPs uh, are in future uh, better equipped and more comfortable uh, with raising difficult issues uh, around incontinence. The key point, as the Australian numbers illustrate, that if we tackle this early in the uh, occurrence of a problem, there is a real economic saving besides the real benefit uh, to the quality of life of people who suffer from incontinence. Sustained and regular exercise, yes, that's important and helpful, uh, with the caveats that I, I, I've just heard. But the potential to alleviate uh, unnecessary pain, anxiety and aggravation, and to improve the quality of mental health uh, of people who suffer from incontinence, this is a subject which has too long been neglected. This debate is a contribution, but not the end of the story, in improving things for incontinence sufferers. Presiding officer. <laughs> I have Brian Whittle to be followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest and in that I have a close relative who's a healthcare professional working in the NHS. And I would also like to congratulate Alex Cole Hamilton for securing time in this chamber to raise awareness of this issue. And it's an issue that many people find difficult to talk about, as, as the member has said in his motion, and it's something of a taboo subject. Even when we do find ourselves talking about incontinence, it's infrequently the basis of a joke rather than a serious discussion, which is not to say, as has already been said, that it, it should, we shouldn't make light of a serious subject. I'd argue that, that the first steps towards dealing with the impact of conditions like this are to make talking about them something people are more comfortable with. I'm, I'm reminded of the way that Billy Connolly is dealing with his Parkinson's disease by weaving that into his show and leaving the stage to the track, a whole lot of shaking going on. And we find ourselves laughing at that probably uncomfortably laughing at that, that sort of black humour. And it's, it's the aforementioned Billy Connolly, actually, that's responsible for the fact that I know that incontinence strikes at all ages because of his very legendary skit in incontinence and during his, his an audience with uh, Billy Connolly. But it's important that we never lose sight uh, of the people who live with incontinence. This is a condition, as already been mentioned, that's a profound physical, psychological and e economic impact on a person's life. 
and it can place a hurdle between them being able to undertake a day-to-day -day activities that many of us take for granted. Uh, and that question always at the back of their mind, will I be able to do this with this condition? Now, those who see incontinence as little more of an inconvenience, but the reality for many is a life-changing condition. And this was forcibly brought home to me uh, during our ongoing work with the Petitions Committee, in which you are doing some work with the transventional mesh issue, as was mentioned again in, in the motion. We have heard really harrowing details of the fallout uh, when this procedure linked to incontinence issues after childbirth and many issues when it goes wrong. And the evidence sessions I took part in have been some of the most challenging uh, of my short time in this parliament. We heard from many who are currently suffering horrendous pain in the aftermath of their operation, as well as having to deal with the realization that their normal everyday life, we all take for granted, has been ruined. Remembering that many of these uh, sufferers are young women. The vision of the cabinet secretary and the chief medical officer being cross-examined in committee with rows of women in wheelchairs sat behind them reacting to the answers has stayed with me as certainly the most challenging session uh, I've been involved with, such was the strength of feeling in that room. And, and it certainly highlighted the responsibility we as MSPs carry in this place and how the decisions we make and the discussions we have can make a profound effect on the lives of others. And unfortunately, there appears to be a connection between our difficulty talking about it and a lack of joined up support and treatment for people suffering from incontinence. As Alex Cole Hamilton points out in his, in his motion, many cases of incontinence could be prevented through greater and more consistent training for nurses, midwives, health visitors and other medical professionals. And it's worth pointing out that in some cases, such as the cause, uh, as caused by obesity, could be at least partially treated by encouraging changes in lifestyle. That kind of joined up thinking, especially in early intervention, I think is a crucial element in preventing such conditions or potentially at least lessening the need for more invasive interventions. In this, the role of the GP is so vital, which is why there is such an, such an emphasis being put on primary care from the benches on this side of the chamber. Early intervention with physiotherapy has been shown to be very effective in addressing incontinence, but key to that early intervention is incontinence being taken seriously and there, have been enough, uh, and there being enough trained physiotherapists available, something which I am concerned about may not be the case at the moment. And this need for more physiotherapy specialists will have to fight for oxygen in an atmosphere where many other healthcare professionals are crying out for more investment. It's therefore crucially important that we use members' debates such as this one to highlight these issues and the subsequent needs. And I would therefore like to take the opportunity once again to thank Alex Cole Hamilton for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Thank you. The last contribution in the open debate is from Neil Finlay. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. I can declare an interest. Both my wife and daughter work in the healthcare uh, sector. Um, can I thank uh, Alec Cole Hamilton for bringing this very important debate to Parliament and, and for agreeing to uh, jointly sponsor uh, the event uh, next week, uh, that, uh, where we will hear from Elaine Miller. Uh, and uh, the topic is, is P a feminist issue? Um, I certainly look forward to that performance uh, on Tuesday night and of course everyone is welcome to attend. Um, members debates in this parliament uh, are often, you, you often get some revelations in it and today has been no different. We've actually found out that um, Stuart Stephen has actually learned something today when most of us who have listened to Mr Stevenson's contributions over the years would have thought that Mr Stevenson knows everything but apparently not so uh, that's today's revelation for me. Um, incontinence is a deeply personal issue and has huge impact on uh, people's quality of life. And I'm glad Mr Whittle uh, mentioned uh, Billy Conley's sketch because that was a, a very funny uh, routine. But for those who are affected by incontinence, it's far from funny because it affects their relationship, their jobs, their sex life, their, their social life, their ability to uh, to do normal everyday things and that is no uh, laughing matter it's thoroughly thoroughly miserable um, and for many women it's, as people have said it's the impact of childbirth that causes their problem with tears and strains and prolapse and damage damaged muscles uh, all contributing factors um, and for many this is the start of a life uh, trying to cope with the constant fear of embarrassment and lives that are uh, dominated and their thought process is dominated by where the nearest toilet is. Um, of course, many women who have suffered could have their condition 
improved or completely resolved through uh, better pre- and postnatal education, better care and rehabilitation. Simple checks. Uh, we've heard in the briefings about questionnaires, self-assessment tools for uh, or, or pelvic floor exercises and physio can all help. And they can all have dramatic results, but so many people do not get that information, do not get that advice, and do not get that care. Um, and for too many women, far too many women, they were told that this issue could be resolved. It could be resolved very quickly by a new gold standard procedure that would fix their prolapse or their incontinence. A new gold uh, standard procedure sold to them by the medical multinationals like Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson and enthusiastically promoted by surgeons who bought the spin or were pressured by health boards in the medical establishment. And the reality is that gold standard procedure has left tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of women across the world horribly injured, disabled, unemployed, wheelchair bound, with broken relationships and broken dreams. And yet still, mesh implants are being implanted in women. Now, I hope this parliament will debate the mesh scandal in the next few weeks, uh, because it is the least we can do for those who have been suffering. We must get answers to the, the pr problems that have been exposed in this global scandal. Presiding officer, incontinence is not just part of life. It's a condition that with the right uh, interventions can be improved and resolved, giving people back their lives, their confidence, their well-being and self-esteem. So can I thank uh, Alec Cole Hamilton for bringing this debate and I look forward to women and men receiving much better help and support for this con con uh, distressing condition. And can I please urge the Cabinet Secretary and yourself, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, to join us next Tuesday for the performance of Gusset Grippers, where Elaine will use comedy to address this very serious issue. Thank you. I call on Shona Robson to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I too thank Alex Cole Hamilton for raising uh, this motion, and I'm sure uh, there will be a, a fantastic uh, turnout for Elaine Miller's performance on uh, Tuesday night and has been said by Alex Cole Hamilton and others that continence issues can affect people of all ages and can have a, a profound effect on an individual's quality of life and there may also be an impact on wider health issues such as an increased risk of falls and fractures for some people and it's vital to diagnose the, the cause of incontinence and not just treat the symptoms in order to achieve better outcomes for patients. I'm therefore determined that all patients with continence issues receive uh, a first-class service that they deserve. My aim is that patients see the right person at the right time uh, and certainly early enough to provide them with support and advice on how to manage their condition. Early intervention is crucial and NHS boards are uh, trying to address this. For example, NHS Lothian is piloting a system for the redirection of patients from consultant care to physiotherapy care where clinically appropriate patients can there, thereby access the most appropriate care and reduce unnecessary consultant appointments and be seen faster. Uh, in addition, an increasing number of specialist physiotherapists have trained in prescribing, thereby improving patient care and decreasing the need for multiple GP appointments, again, um, reducing time. My aim is just a second, yeah. Uh, my aim is that whatever the setting, care is provided to the highest standards of quality and safety with the person at the centre of all decisions in line with recognised standards and best practice. Yeah. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, and I'm grateful too for the, her delineating the clinical response to this issue. As you will have heard, there is much unanimity in this chamber around this issue today. It's something from which all party politics is stripped. So will the Cabinet Secretary take that unanimity and uh, foster a commit to looking towards a national strategy around continents, which addresses not just the clinical response to the issues, but all the social issues around awareness, things like access to public toilets, and the rest of the issues that members have raised in this debate this afternoon. Shona Robson. Well, I'll certainly uh, take away uh, and look at what more uh, can be done and the appropriate way to, to take forward the many issues that have been raised uh, in 
this debate. The, the motion, and, and many members have mentioned, the, the lack of formal training for the midwifery, health visitor and physiotherapy workforce on basic incontinence provision. And members will be aware that midwives receive education on incontinence as a result of childbirth as part of their undergraduate preparation. There are also significant training resources available for staff at a local level, including for the care sector. These include uh, modules provided by board continence teams uh, and also e-learning opportunities but we need to make sure uh, that uh, those are being used and that staff are getting the opportunity uh, to uh, train and the majority of boards do have dedicated continence teams who provide direct care and support to patients. They also provide advice and support to other health professionals, including the care sector and carers who manage bladder and bowel problems. It's also important that all NHS and social care staff are aware of the effect that their practice can have on a patient's continence uh, status. For example, that some medication may exacerbate the uh, continence issues. There's huge potential for improvement in people's quality of life that can be achieved with the appropriate continence care. Midwives, nurses and allied health professionals have a particularly important role in supporting people uh, with continence issues. Boards uh, also provide continence care for residents of care, of care homes. I was particularly uh, interested in what Fulton McGregor had to say uh, about this. And this can vary from uh, providing direct care through their continence teams to providing support to registered nurses in care homes to enable them to carry out patient assessments. Many older people will remain fit and well, but we also know that health problems generally increase with age and that many of us will need some help and support at some stage. It should be acknowledged that many people are supported to manage their continence issues by the NHS as well as the third sector to live full, independent, and in many cases, active lives at home and at work. And I am aware that barriers to seeking help include embarrassment, lack of knowledge of treatment options available and misconception, for example, that suffering from incontinence is a normal part of ageing, which of course it's not. Uh, I would therefore encourage anyone who has a, a continence problem to seek help from our caring and compassionate health professionals. And I'd also like to thank the wide range of NHS staff uh, who uh, are doing excellent work in supporting people with continence issues. Boards also seek to promote good bladder and bowel health as part of a, a public health message to prevent continence problems arising in the first place. For example, many boards have public information leaflets on, on how to maintain a healthy bladder and bowel. In addition, for example, NHS Grampian holds a joint clinic which focuses on a 12-week health promotion and education programme on continence. Uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have also redesigned their continence service to focus on preventative measures. They aim to support patients to better manage their symptoms and break down the myths and stigma often associated with incontinence. And I'm delighted that the board's specialist bladder and bowel service was awarded the National Care Award for 2016-17. Um, the members will uh, also hopefully be aware that there is a, a national contract in place for the supply of continence products, which is tendered every three years. And I appreciate the sensitivities of continence provision and the degree of distress caused if patients are not confident in the products that they use. Uh, people uh, already have access to free continence pads, as um, the issue raised by Alison Johnson. Uh, people may, of course, choose to buy extra pads, and of course, uh, continence pads are, are also free to people in care homes. And I would expect all boards and staff involved in the provision of continence care to engage appropriately and sensitively with patients and to fully support them to ensure their dignity, comfort and independence. The Scottish Government is also keen to have continued dialogue with stakeholders, including the Association for Continence Advice Scotland on how services and care can be improved both nationally and locally. And it, perhaps that would be a good starting point to explore some of the issues raised in the debate today and how they can be uh, taken forward. Uh, some of this work is already happening. For example, NHS Board Continence leads meet quarterly to discuss and share good practice. But I get the sense from members here today that there is more to be done. And I'm very happy to take that away and look at whether we can use these existing structures uh, to do that. A number of members have mentioned the issue uh, of transvaginal mesh implants um, and it, you know, I could spend a great deal of time going over uh, many of the issues raised and the uh, experience at the, the public petitions committee. Um, uh, I certainly look forward to using the debate opportunity 
uh, in, the, the, in the near future to provide an opportunity to not least to update Parliament on progress made on some of the actions that uh, myself and the Chief Medical Officer took to uh, undertake and progress, uh, not least the independently chaired MESH Oversight Group, which is being set up in a second, that is being set up by Healthcare Improvement Scotland, uh, and uh, of course will meet before the end of the year, and I look forward to providing more detail of that in the debate. Yes. Neil Finlay. We look forward to the Petitions Committee having a parliamentary debate, but there is, of course, the option of the Minister bringing a debate forward in government time. Shona Robson. Well, um, as Neil Finlay knows, uh, a great deal of time has been spent going into all of the detail of this issue uh, at the Public Petitions Committee. I think it's quite right that, therefore, that information uh, is brought through a, a committee debate. It's as valid for a committee to, to bring that debate here as it would be for the government. And I think we have to think very carefully about what the purpose is. Uh, of, of that is, I think, uh, as it is very clear from NHS England, who's published a report on MESH during the sum summer, which made similar recommendations to uh, the report that was uh, being discussed by the Public Petitions Committee. So, uh, you know, uh, and again, we can reflect on that NHS England report in the Public Petitions uh, Committee debate and what that adds uh, to these very complex and difficult issues. Um, can I... Um, end uh, by offering my thanks to members for their contributions to this debate and for sharing patient experiences with the Chamber. We uh, um, certainly recognise that there's more that can be done and certainly I would be happy to ask the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Nursing Officer to jointly write to NHS boards to reinforce the importance of a continent service that is person-centred and tailored to people's needs, including prevention and early intervention, picking up on some of the points made in this uh, important debate today. Uh, we must and we will keep looking at what we can do better, how we can transform and improve care, how we can equip ourselves to deliver even better health and social care services in the future for those who live with continence issues. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting until 2.30pm.